Before history is written, it's played. Before it's frozen in time, it's fought one shift at a time. Before it's etched in silver, it's carved in ice. What happens next will last forever. The Stanley Cup Final on ABC and ESPN Plus begins Saturday. I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on Earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to the most haunted city on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Most Haunted City on Earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And I'm JT Timmons. And we are fresh back from New England. Yes, Woo-hoo. we are. The Great Northeast. The Great Northeast. The what was that? North no, East. No, no East. The Northeast. The yes. Northeast. The Northeast. Um, yes, we're we're back. And we just got done with the Conjuring House. So uh, that was quite an experience it really was <laughs> it really was <laughs> jt had quite the Probably time the the most uh intense uh experience at the conjuring house uh, yeah. out of all of us mm-hmm. yeah this tuesday uh we we actually shot a po- uh, podcast episode in the conjuring house well, at 6 a.m at, after six, pulling a full all-nighter yes you can tell you can tell we were the, the photo that yeah. megan took of me <laughs> <laughs> Done. <laughs> She's over yeah, it. I'm over it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we shot a um, podcast episode in the Conjuring House. That'll be this Tuesday. Um, and yeah, they're, they're listening to this on Saturday. So yes. that'll be this Tuesday. Uh, everything that we film um, in the Conjuring House has to be approved by the 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 person, the the faceless person that I have been um, emailing uh, at the Conjuring House. So once I get approval, I'm gonna upload it for the pair junkies, and then we are gonna um, uh, then we're going to upload it uh, for Tuesday yep. for public. Yep. yep, so yep, yep. you'll see it when you see it. But it's um, yeah, the house in general is. W- weird um <laughs> oh my gosh just real fast juanita's birthday is on friday dawn's is today and nikki's is tomorrow so many wow. aquarii wow uh, uh, it's the aquarius ghost thing mm-hmm. i'm telling you yeah that's it's the wild age of aquarius too yeah happy go. birthday everybody that's what's yes, up. happy birthday to all of y'all that's really cool um and happy birthday to any of you who are listening your birthday is coming up yes mm-hmm, absolutely mm-hmm. happy spooky birthday um i didn't mean to interrupt you so yeah no, as you were it's saying okay but yeah i was saying though that the country house is just weird um if uh, i we, we definitely confirmed that the lights thing that we talked about with mr kenyon and um all of his cryptic messages right. um for the safety of your family Leave the lights on. Leave the lights on. He's right. Yeah. Um, He's 100% correct because lights really bizarrely affect the spirits in this house. And we learned- Because one of our first encounters was- Right. Was was a, it hurts. It hurts. The lights hurt. Quit doing that. (laughs) Yeah, quit doing, stop. Stop that. Also, don't touch the little knickknacks that people leave for it. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Chris got scolded. I got scolded. By a ghost. (laughs) Don't touch things that don't belong to you. But- (laughs) Which I guess is a good um, thing to note in any Mm -hmm. general circumstance. But yeah. um, We had a blast. Yeah, we had a blast. Um, You're going to see lots of content on that. Um, Chris and I got so scared in the live stream. We got so scared outside by the barn. Three drums pounding right behind us. We have no idea to this day. So Mm -hmm. insane. To this very minute. uh, uh, On on two different uh, mediums. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be revisiting this a lot. You know, I yes. think that, uh, as our first outing as a team, um, 
it was a very successful extremely uh, uh, hunt and now we're looking for more experiences like it yeah exactly and if you want to watch that nine and a half hour live stream <laughs> that we did um you can still access it as a para junkie so para junkies uh we had a few of them who stayed with us the whole night yes um, and so that was really fun and they definitely, I think had a great time as well. Y'all can sign off in the comments if you would like, if you had a good time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is going to live on Patreon though forever. So if you want mm -hmm. to access all of that, uh, definitely go check us out on Patreon. Um, and we're going to be doing a very similar style of that when we go to Waverly Hills, which is our next yep. adventure. So this is a very good time to be a patron um, and a para junkie as well. Uh, because not only do you get these live streams, but you also get the library of all the other content that we did. Mm -hmm. And they are going to see all of the... Um, 360 videos that we filmed in the house, all of the uh, episodes we filmed in the house, they're all getting that first um, before the public does. And that's, of course, with every episode that we do, Para Junkies always see it first. So uh, definitely check us out over on Patreon. And ad free. And ad free. Yeah, that whole nine and a half hour live stream, you, just, you could just straight veg it. You could. You, you could just bench it. Watch just that bad boy. Literally, just, just have through. it going in the background, and then you'll hear a scream at times, and you'll know something crazy is happening, <laughs> and that's that's a good time. Especially Debria. Debria was very vocal with her screams to yes. alert everybody um, yes. that something was going down. So, but well, she she steeled up through the night. She, she really did. did. Like, she started off very nervous, we, but by the end, she was she was raring to go. We turned them lights off, and she was doing great. I yeah. was like, I was expecting us to turn the lights back on, and she's just like, like fainted on the floor. But she was killing it. I was yeah. like, all right, all right, Debrio. But yes. Um, but before we get into today's episode, uh, we do want to thank a few of our para junkies, our new para junkies. Yeah, we got a bunch of them. We did. We got a bunch of y'all. Um, Love it. So we want to thank Stephanie Wesson, Alyssa Medina, Nina Torres, Kylie Carter, Mackenzie Norman, Natalie. Romero, Annalise Megan, uh, Chelsea Borisov, Maggie Morgans, Kirk Her Her Hori Hori Uchi, excuse me, Kirk, I'm so sorry to botch your last name, uh, Kirk H, Jason V, Salem the Spirited, Pamela, and Pixel Pete. Pixel woo -woo. Pete. Pixel yeah, Pete. That's I like a that great name. name. Yeah. That's very <laughs> Love fun. It. Love it. Um, but yeah, so thank you guys so much for becoming para junkies. We really appreciate you and hope you enjoy all of the content that you are going to have coming at to you. Yes, you are the reason we can go, go to places like Waverly, Waverly Hills. Hills. Woohoo! We're and on to the next one already and we're still cutting conjuring up. Literally. Yep. Um, yeah, we're going to Louisville, Kentucky. Yeehaw. Yeehaw. No. And so um yeah, we're going to be going out there. We're going to go investigate Waverly Hills. We're bringing the ghost feathers with us again. Um, and we are currently um, in the planning process for this. So we are on the track of booking. Uh, we are just still uh, nailing down a date. So once we have that date, Para Junkies will find out first. And then y'all will find out. Um, uh, basically, when we're going to be doing this, we're going to be live streaming. Of course, we're going to be um, doing SC's methods. We're going to stick to Bria in the body shoot. Um, we're gonna drop 360 cameras around mm -hmm. yeah yeah speaking of 360 pair junkies are gonna see it first uh we took 360 video of the conjuring house and uh you can actually if you have vr goggles or just use your phone um see what it's like to be standing in the conjuring house which yeah. is pretty and dope. you might catch something that we were not privy to oh absolutely we mm -hmm. left the camera alone so you know any number of things could be happening i mean it's, it's like going oh, on yeah. an investigation Exactly. Yes. So um, those are going to be really cool to watch. Um, and also, I can't wait to hear back from everybody of like things we might have missed Absolutely. after the fact. Yep. Yep. Um, because there are lots of times. And we when, have hours and hours of footage to, to, yes. to pull through anyway. Yes. So. Exactly. Um, but today's episode is actually not about the Conjuring House at all. But nope. um, JT and Bria and I, after the Conjuring House, we made a little jaunt up to New York City. And um, being a nerd, I and a tour guide for a very long time, <laughs> I <laughs> decided uh, we were going to do a true crime tour, but not like take a true crime tour. I wrote one. Well, I pulled some stories and took them around. And so I'm going to give you guys those places that I took them to. And we have photos of it. 
and all that. They're very interesting yes. stories. Um, mostly these stories happen in Greenwich Village and the Soho area of New York. So if you're familiar with Manhattan, uh, it's a little bit further south on the island. And so, um, yeah, it's going to be quite the time. So let's dive right on into it. Let's do it. Do, do, do. All right. So we're kicking it off with the Hangman's Elm. Ooh, the hangman's elm. It's very creepy. <laughs> um, it's So here's the thing. It's like in the spring, because it still obviously has leaves. It doesn't look this craggly all the time. Um, but, and if you are seeing the video of this, it's this massive tree that looks evil yeah. um it looks so quite evil not it's and strange uh, yeah yeah yes. absolutely. you thick. get a sense, a sense of like, that, that. Yes. like three c's it's thick it's thick yeah. well yeah it was you know a huge tree before new york was exactly new york, so. um so the hangman's elm is manhattan's oldest known living tree it is shrouded in tales of its use for executions. Uh, it's located in Washington Square Park's northwest corner. Uh, it's an English elm and is renowned for its exceptionally sturdy wood. I mean, which is, I guess, what you would want if yeah. you were going to hang people from it. Um, theoretically, <laughs> it is capable of supporting something as heavy as a school bus. Wow. Which is wild. That is wild. That's a Thick That's tree. extremely wild. And if you ever have to execute a school bus, you yeah. know, no, you can, you can <laughs> yeah. hang it from the tree. It, imagine, like school bus Christine, and you, <laughs> you gotta get, you gotta off it. But anyways, um, <laughs> on a bright spring day, the tree appears less sinister. Like I was saying. Um, oh. Contrasting with its very dark reputation, we got lucky and got to see it in the dead of winter, where it fits its <laughs> reputation. <laughs> it looks especially frightening. <laughs> it's, it's like, so here's the thing. It's not the only tree in Washington Square Park. Like, you literally walk up and you see trees, 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 and you're like, I wonder which one it is. And then you see it and you're like, it's definitely it's that, that one. one. Yeah, it's that one. It's most certainly <laughs> yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah. You're not going to miss it. Um but it is also known as the hanging tree. It stands impressively at 110 feet and is over 330 years old, yep. as estimated by the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Now, while its status as the oldest tree in the city is not certain, it's certainly among the oldest, dating back to the time um, when New Netherland was right. renamed to New York. <laughs> And the moniker Hangman's Elm has been used since the 19th century. Um, so the tree is linked to a very a various amounts of hangings, including those of traitors during the Revolutionary War. And nearby, the former Newgate State Prison on Christopher and 10th Streets possibly used this tree for executing inmates, although there's no official records of these hangings. Um, and that's partially because back in that time period, when you executed people, it wasn't necessarily documented. You're like, well, you right. just throw them in the in the wheelbarrow and take them on out. <laughs> you know, they they didn't do time of death. They didn't do right. like a signing of your death certificate and things. And that wasn't only for you know inmates or uh, people they deemed as lesser. That happened even with normal, you know, just regular civilians. So. Mm. But, yeah, a lot of our knowledge of executions came from the fact that crowds would develop, and then, yes. then and then they would speak of it. So it's not like there was a um, uh, official documentation in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you didn't know, um, people have always been morbid, but especially during the Victorian era and um, yeah. and a little bit before that. Because public entertainment, like I tell people when we go through Wright Square, public entertainment uh, is lacking um, at that time. <laughs> and so oftentimes people would uh, gather at the gallows and go to see the execution. So they bring their kids, they bring a little picnic and have a great old time. Um, and then there were some especially morbid people. Um, this happened a lot in Savannah where they wanted an extra little bit of entertainment. And so they'd often pay executioners to take a couple knots out of yeah. the noose. Um, well, in, in most states or colonies at this point, uh, at least when all these executions were happening, uh, the law usually stated you had to hang by the neck until dead. And so if there is a perfect number of knots to put in a noose to clean break a neck. I'm not going to tell you what that number is. But, <laughs> um, yeah, if you take a couple out, 
um, then usually it'll half break the neck. If you take a, if you put a couple more in, it'll pop the head pop clean head, off. Head right off. Yeah. And yep. so um, this would happen where people would pay these executioners because they're like, I want to see a head roll today. Right. You know, it's. Um, and so usually these hangings were very gruesome and very, very um, br a brutal way to go. Um, so just bear that in mind when you're looking at the picture of this tree. Um, the park area was also known for being a formal, uh, former burial site for slaves and yellow fever victims. So that does hold some dark history, of course, mm -hmm. um, and also would add to a lot of the, I think, uh, dreariness of the square when you walk through it, when you know this information. Um, now, the closest confirmed execution near the tree was that of Rose Butler, who was a slave that was accused of arson and was executed about 500 feet from the elm in 1820. Um, and in 2008, archaeologists discovered four nearly complete skeletons during a soil testing project in the park, adding to the numerous others found and respectfully left undisturbed in the area. So more than likely what they did find, I didn't get a confirmation of who they think these people were. Um, but well, it was a potter's field, right? I mean, it was yeah. uh, because it wasn't just like. Yellow fever victims. It was impoverished. It was you know derelict dead. It was exactly. You know. um, so it could have been a number of different people, uh, but it's usually best if you do just come across uh, four bodies, and they're that decomposed, and you know they're from a really long time ago. Maybe it is best to just leave them there. Maybe leave a little marker and let yeah. you know just be respectful. But regardless, very creepy tree. And when you look at it and you picture these uh, horrific deaths that occurred there. It definitely makes your skin crawl for oh, yeah. sure. Um, yeah, JT was very excited to visit this tree. He had no idea where I was taking him ever. Yeah, I had no idea. Um, so yeah, he got very oh oh narrow. Oh, did you? <laughs> there we there go. You go. Okay, there we go. Um, so after the hanging elm, we went to the site where the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire happened. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was right there, right? Yeah, it like yeah. It's <laughs> not very far from it. Yeah. Um, Right across the street. And if you didn't know, <laughs> when you walk through Greenwich Village, it's so bougie and it's <laughs> yeah. so clean and nice. But these horrific things happen there, so it's quite a juxtaposition. Um, but this was a historic fire. Um, now, if you ever, if you went to school in the public system in the U.S., you probably heard about this in your U.S. history class uh, because it did make a lot of effects it, yeah, in, in um, the unions. In the yeah. unions, um, but if you didn't. Then I'm here to give you a little history lesson on this here um, fire because it was gnarly to yes. say the yes. least. Horrific. Yes, it was horrific. Um, now, this was a historic fire known as the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Uh, it took place on March 25th, 1911, with victims totaling up to 146. That is so insane! Wow, for just one fire! Wow. Um, so over the years, there have been numerous reports of ghostly sightings of trapped female garment workers that continue to replay the disaster of that horrible day. And students at the school, because NYU now owns it. Right, it's, a, um, it's part of the NYU campus. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the students at the school claim to see the shapes of these women leaping from upper floors to escape the phantom flames. And sometimes they do catch a glimpse of the famous kissing couple, a pair who pecked each other goodbye before jumping to their deaths from adjacent windows. Aw, that's like, so romantic. If you like dark romance, there you go. That's your moment. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> but, super into it. Congratulations. Um, but most of the women who worked for the Triangle Waste uh, Company were Jewish, Italian, and German immigrants, and they ranged from ages like 14 being the youngest up into the mid uh, their mid 40s. Uh, so a lot of a variety of different people were working in this building. Uh, one of the main people who we do know who passed from this fire, who does still seem to be coming back as a spirit in ways, is Yetta Berger. Um, she was an Austrian woman who immigrated to New York City at 18 and was one of the victims. Uh, like many immigrants at the time, she wanted a chance to live the American dream. Now, Yetta was known for her elegance and beautiful long brown hair. And in 1911, she became an examiner of finished shirtwaists or women's blouses at the factory. Now, back then, there were no labor unions, so women had to work long hours for very little pay. 
On weekdays, they would clock in nine-hour days, but they also had to work for seven hours on uh, Saturdays. This meant that they were earning a mere $10 a week. And by today's standards, wow. that is the equivalent equivalent of making $4 an hour. Whoa. Really, really brutal. Yeah. That is terrible brutal. Terrible conditions, terrible pay. Exactly. Um, now, the fire was said to have started on the eighth floor, but Yetta, who worked on the ninth floor, could sense immediately its intense heat. From her documented injuries and cause of death, Yetta was one of those who jumped. The impact of the fall instantly broke her spine and both femurs. Mm. She lay bleeding all over the sidewalk before finally being rescued and taken to the hospital. Unfortunately, the doctors could not save her, and so she did die from her injuries. Jeez. Inside the Brown Building, where all this happened, that's what the NYU um, uh, school calls it now, is the Brown Building. Uh, people still see Yetta walking down the stairs and onto the street to the same spot where she landed. She's often accompanied by the heavy smell of smoke and burnt flesh. In 1916, New York University repurposed the A floor for classrooms and a library, and students have seen women fleeing down its hallways after appearing out of nowhere from one of the bathrooms. Um, ghosts are also heard throughout the Brown Building. Their screams sound as if they are still trying to escape from the terrible fire. The ninth floor is considered to be the most haunted, though, because that was where the most people died. Um, there is a mirror by the elevators where um, s some students do claim to see a charred woman. And sometimes her reflection flickers as if it's being viewed through flames. Hmm. Now, the main reason why the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire was so significant was that it brought to light how mismanaged and dangerous garment factories in the States were. After investigating the building, FDNY discovered many fire traps and violations. Also, since no fire drills were practiced at the factory, employees were ignorant of the building's layout. Uh, they thus did not know how to exit quickly in the case of an emergency. And loft and factory buildings were, uh, where people speaking different languages are employed should have placards in their languages telling them how to get out in case of a fire, noted Fire Marshal William L. Beers. Now, uh, with no informative signage or evacuation training, most workers were left with only one option, to jump. And so the Triangle Waste Company owned the 8th through 10th floors of the Ash Building, back, uh, which is what it was called back in that day, which was located um, at that time between 23rd and 29th Washington Place in Greenwich Village. Now, one initial theory on what had started the fire suggested that it was an explosion of gasoline-heated irons on the eighth floor. But the fire marshal would later conclude that it was actually an unextinguished match or cigarette butt thrown into one of the factory scrap bins. Mm. Mm. Scrap bins, which were placed under cutters tables, ha held leftover unused fabric. This is highly flammable material, and it offered the perfect kindling for a fire. So the workers on the A floor tried desperately to warn the others on the other floors, and they managed to reach the 10th floor via phone, uh, but they had no way of speaking to those on the 9th, uh, writes David R. R. David Vaughn Drehel. Um, now, most people working on the 9th floor that day did not survive at all. Oof. So as the fire began to spread, so did the panic, and both stairwells and elevators became uh, very jammed with people, making an, an efficient evacuation impossible. Mm. So within a few minutes, uh, the workers' escape options dwindled, and a lucky few had managed to escape through the only operating elevator. And remember, this is 1911, so it's not like an elevator nowadays. It's yeah. like mm. one of those, if you've ever been in a freight elevator, it's like that. And they're Where you very, like slide the door closed. Right. And, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Not efficient. Um, but despite the unbearable heat, two heroic bellmen who worked the car up and down the building, um, they had worked the car up and down the building until the shaft finally collapsed. Um, so some of the women that attempted to climb down the cables of that um, elevator, they attempted to do this, but they would only fall to their deaths on top of the cars beneath them. Oof. Mm. So some of the remaining employees scrambled to a crowded fire escape, but the flimsy iron could not hold all that weight. And so it broke, throwing 20 people nearly 100 feet before they hit the hard concrete pavement below. Mm. By the time rescue workers managed to extinguish the flame, 141 people had died. 
A crowd of bystanders and reporters had since gathered on the streets because, like I told you before, people were morbid at this time. <laughs> Extra morbid. I mean, um, we're always morbid. We're That's, visiting it's, it's, the place. So yeah. what did that say about yeah. us? Well, I'm not claiming we're not morbid. Yeah. I'm just saying these people were especially Well, it would be morbid. hard to imagine in a city a, a big fire that yeah. didn't draw a crowd. Right. Yeah. You know, out of concern, out of curiosity, out of morbidity. Right. They watched in horror as countless charred bodies were mm. carried out of the building. And one reporter, William Gunn Shepard, wrote sadly, I learned a new sound that day, a sound more horrible than description can picture, the thud of a speeding living body on a stone sidewalk. Mm -mm. An additional five people passed away within the next few days, bringing the total number of deaths to an alarming 146. The oldest victim was a mother of three named uh, Providercia, Paro, who was uh, 43 years old. The youngest were Kate Leon and Sarah Rosaria Maltese, who were both 14. The owners of the company, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, managed to survive by fleeing to the roof when the fir fire first started. Mm -hmm. The owners survived? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. The two who already had suspicious history of factory fires... Um, they were charged with first and second degree manslaughter because mm -hmm. of this. A lot of their decisions, i.e. not having proper sprinkler systems installed, keeping exits locked during work hours, etc., uh, contributed to the huge loss of lives. But there were also several oversights on part of the FDNY that made the situa uh, situation even more disastrous. Uh, their fire truck ladders were not long enough to reach the upper floors, for instance, mm. and their feeble safety nets couldn't catch the women. This is a quote. Couldn't catch the women who were jumping three at a time. Mm. Oof. As a result, the street quickly became littered with crumpled bodies. As for the women still trapped inside, many got stuck in ele elevator shafts. And those who weren't burned alive died from asphyxiation. Thank you. My mouth isn't working with me today. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, but yes, mm -hmm. the Brown Building has thus accumulated a lot of ghostly happenings over the years. And door handles are known to jiggle by themselves, for instance, perhaps by ghostly workers who are still trying to escape the flames. Uh, their footsteps are often heard running up and down the stairwells. Lectures and study sessions are also frequently interrupted by the crackle of ghostly flames. Mm. So, if you didn't know, now you know. Um, <laughs> because that is one of the most brutal, in my opinion, um, uh, disasters in that period of time in American history. Yeah. Uh, just gruesome and avoidable disaster making right. it all the more tragic you know it's all the more tragic that it was really just as uh, as simple as having the doors unlocked yep. because that in its in its base is such a, a gut turning thought of running from a fire only to hit a door that won't open exactly um it's and rough. on the paranormal side of things i think a lot of it is residual haunting oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, because you know we've talked about it before with residual hauntings a lot of times when people exert very extreme emotions it leaves behind an impression and I hope that most of them are not living for eternity thinking that they are about to catch on fire um, but I think we do feel the effects of such yes. a yeah, heinous absolutely. event so much loss of life in such a short amount of time High, heightened heightened emotional yeah. content um, and so if you go to NYU and you ever took a class in that building, let us know if you ever experienced anything, because I'm intrigued, yeah, to say the I, least. I went uh, to high school with um, the guy in Please Don't Destroy, Ben Marshall. Uh, he and I are actually good friends. And so he went to NYU. And I'm like, I'm going to I'm going to hit him up and see if he can't like potentially talk yes, because he's famous. Yeah. <laughs> he's like super famous now. He, I mean, he's just killing it. And I'm like, I, I'm like, I'm thinking of my ways in because I would love to investigate that spot. And I feel like I feel like he could probably ask NYU for anything. They'd be like, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. I think you underestimate how many famous NYU. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's true. <laughs> but it's just, are. He, he's super hot right now. Worth a shot, though. Yeah, yeah. worth a but. shot. Um, but moving on to our next encounter, which was the Manhattan Well murder. Ooh. Ooh. 
This one was very interesting because I hadn't heard about it until I started researching. It's also very unassuming because if you walked by this store where this happened, you would have no idea. <laughs> Truly, you would have no idea because the yep. other places have markers for these events. Um, like NYU has put a whole plaque on um, the wall of the building mm -hmm. that uh, denotes the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire and those who lost their lives there. Uh, this does not. No. So you have to be no. in the know um, <laughs> to know about this. But uh, so the the main uh, victim here was Guillelma uh, Sands, also known as Elma. Uh, she had lived in a boarding house in the later years of 1799 uh, in Soho, what mm -hmm. is now Soho. Um, and so in December of that year, this young woman had found herself in a secret affair with a man, very scandalous for the time, of course, uh, who also lived on the street. The man's name was Levi Weeks. He was a carpenter in the local area. The two had planned on eloping, but Elma had left her home on the night of December 22nd in hopes that she and Levi would return married. Very romantic for you dark romantics again. Um it was said that Elma left around 8 p.m. that night, according to a cousin of Elma's, uh, Catherine Ring. Now, she stated that the front door had closed around that time. However, she never saw Levi or Elma leaving. It was later. It wasn't until uh, 10 p.m. that night that Levi arrived back at the home and he was demanding to know where his soon to be wife was. And so it was then that the entire home began to panic. Later on in the investigation, witnesses would claim that they saw Elma. Mm. They had seen her in the Lispinard's meadow, and the witnesses claimed she was with two other men, but they could not identify these men. Mm. So just a few days later, Elma's body would be found. The body of Elma Sands would be pulled from a local well where the witnesses claimed she was seen. Evidence suggested that Elma's neck was broken before she was dumped inside the well. The trial for Elma's death did not last long. It would only last a little over a day. And it was represented by two very infamous lawyers. Yep. The lawyers were Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Ooh. For all you Hamilton fans. Yes. Um, and you know this had to be kind of a gruesome death if these two who hated each other. And regards not like this time. They even make reference to it in the musical ha Hamilton. What do you mean? In the they make reference to this case. Oh, really? Yes. What? I don't think I've caught that ever. Yes. When Alexander Hamilton is going on and on and on and Aaron Burr says not guilty, you know, uh, it, they are doing this murder case. What? And this is the murder case they worked on. Oh. And at the time, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton were not bitter rivals. And technically, they weren't old, they weren't bitter rivals. <laughs> but at the time, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton worked for the same law firm. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I'm going to have to go back and listen yeah, to that. Listen because to it because I don't think I ever caught that. He, it's it's when he states that he's a lawyer. So it's the very beginning of the second act. Okay. Nonstop. Yes. It's in the song Nonstop. He does mm. mention uh, that they're working on a murder case together. There's a lot that happens in Nonstop. So. Yes. yes yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, <I laughs> nonstop has a, a lot in it, but there is mention of this case. Interesting. Wow. Okay. That's really cool. We're all going to go back on our Spotify yeah. and listen to Nonstop. I know, right? Now. Jeez. Okay, cool. That's super, but it's super interesting. Uh, but they were kind of the hotshot lawyers of New York. They were, yeah. So. And, yeah. Alexander Hamilton was, was number one with a bullet, and Aaron Burr was right behind him. Exactly. Um, so they were sought after by Levi's oldest brother. Uh, they believed that Levi was behind the murder. However, he was acquitted at, uh, of the charges due to lack of evidence. To this day, the murder is still a mystery, So, which is unfortunate. But maybe one day, you know, somebody will open a cold case if they're, they get bored. Um, but however, many people claim that they can see her haunting the well where her body was found over 200 years ago. The Manhattan Well was built very close to the death of El Elma Sands, and the well was located in Lispinard Meadow. Uh, this was a very popular area for to be for locals who were in love. I guess it was kind of their lover's field. Not lover's lane, but yeah. lover's field. Lover's meadow. <laughs> meadow. Um, and apparently it was especially popular in the winter. Uh, in the 1820s, many upper and middle class houses were built on this property, and this also meant that the well was sealed over. The well is now located in the basement of the building located at 129 Spring Street. There it is. It's massive. It's I did so not. Big. I was think. I was. 
expecting this like puny little well. It's like not. I was like, oh, it's going to be a little well you walk up to and whatnot. And this thing looks like a freaking chimney. It's yeah. also super jarring because um, it is in a very posh store. It's inside a store. Yeah. <laughs> and this place, literally the whole color palette, gray, black, white, nothing else. And so <laughs> it's like super clean, futuristic streetwear. And then this and it's like, OK, cool. Um, but Yes, so 129 Spring Street is the legal address of where the well, uh, where Elma was murdered, is located. And since the original building of this area, there have been several businesses in it. Uh, in the 1820s, there was a shop there that would sell remedies for those who are uh, were addicted to tobacco. Hmm. Um, after that, it became a beer hall for Germans. Only Germans. Only Germans. <laughs> but after the beer hall, it was left vacant for many years. And then in the 2000s, the well that was hidden for many years would resurface in the headlines. Because a bistro in Manhattan, known as the Manhattan Bistro, you know, yeah, easy. As you do. As one does. Had bought the building to use it for more storage for the restaurant. They would excavate the cellar. And it was at this point that the well had been unearthed. This well had been hidden for about 200 years, and the owner stated that the well gave them bad vibes due to its mm. eerie presence. Oh, yeah. And when they looked at it, they said it didn't look to have aged since the day it was covered. So if you go to the place today, you can now find it in a COS or COS, uh, C-O-S. I liked a lot of the stuff that they were, that they had. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I bought a shirt. Yeah, <laughs> I did. He I did. bought a whole shirt. It's very a posh. A haunted shirt. A haunted, it's a haunted shirt. shirt. Yeah. But yeah, it's very posh if you're into that, like, just very neutrals, basic statement piece or basic, um, you know, timeless pieces. Great store. Alex asked, so this store is super haunted now? Yes, actually. Um, so the well is still in near perfect condition in the basement. Um, it does not look like it is aged, as you can see, and doesn't appear to be going anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the thing. Uh, since Elma was murdered, many women and men in the area have reported seeing apparitions in that area. Mm. Some people state that they can even hear Elma screaming. Now, it is New York, so you never know. But still, <laughs> it's, A lot of people uh, scream there. But, yeah. uh, but still, weird. Um, and those who have witnessed the scream state that Elma is pleading for her life. Mm. Uh, there are also many employees of the businesses that state they have paranormal happenings occur. The employees of the cost have um, blamed several occurrences on Elma. There always is always blame the ghost. Always, mm -hmm. always. Uh, there is often missing merchandise, and the elevators will break. And not to mention, there are random electrical sh shortages and outages that cannot be explained. Now, here's the reason why, though. Many people turn to Elma's cousin for the hauntings and strange happenings. Catherine That's Ring. Yes. Dun dun dun. dun, dun. And strange happenings that surrounded the well. And the transcripts that were recorded after the ruling show us a grueling fact. It states that Catherine Ring, Elma's cousin, had cursed the room. Ooh. It is in the transcripts that she said she calls upon the Almighty to curse them all. Oh, my Lord. It is believed that this curse has led to many deaths. What in the well? It is, it is believed that this curse is responsible for Judge Lansing's, the one who was acquitted, uh, who acquitted Weeks, his death, about 30 years after the trial occurred. The judge had left his hotel in Manhattan, and he went to the post office to post a letter. And however, that day he left, he never returned. Mm. No one could find any trace of him. Mm. He basically vanished into thin air. Wow. If I knew that while we were in there, I would have lost my shirt. Man. No. Anyways. Man. Um, and the investigation into his disappearance had turned up nothing. Oh, boy. He's so, gone. He's gone. I so guess I guess the well's dry. Anyways. Um, so I guess if you're ever in Soho, <laughs> pop into the shop and pretend like you're going to buy something and then go look at the well. It's in the Or base. go buy something. Or go buy Honestly, something. dope, dope, dope stuff. Yes, um, but go into Koss, go into the basement, mm -hmm. and go take a picture in front of the well. Koss is really haunted. It's really haunted. Um, and so for our last one, 
and the reason why I like this story is because this is just a classic, good old fashioned ghost story. <laughs> I really enjoy it. And that is the Ear Inn. Yes. E A R Ear Inn. It's a little pub. It's very cute. If you find yourself, it's very cute. <laughs> and so if you find yourself in uh, Greenwich Village, take a little bit of a walk towards the Hudson River. Um, it's just outside of. Um, Basically, Greenwich Village proper. Uh, it's actually if it's on the same street as Koss. Yep. So if you go to Koss, walk about thirteen minutes to the left of you, mm-hmm. and you're gonna hit the ear in. Um, but the bar's building is the James Brown House. Not that James not, Brown. Not the hardest working man in entertainment. <laughs> no, not that James Brown, but a different James Brown. Um, and it is designated as a historic landmark. It was built around 1770 for James Brown. Um, James Brown was an African-American ex-slave and aide to George Washington in the Revolutionary War. Uh, now, Brown, Brown had planned to retire in a quiet town home and reportedly became a tobacco farmer. Uh, now, little else is known about Brown as detailed records of free slaves were not commonly kept. Uh, But after Brown's death in the mid-1800s, the James Brown House began to transform into a waterfront drinking establishment, selling home-brewed beer and whiskey to sailors coming in from the nearby Hudson River. Uh, Now, the sailors were also fed for free as long as they bought drinks, making the destination that much more appealing to the hungry and thirsty men. By the next century, the establishment had changed into a restaurant, but still maintained its boozy history. Uh, Not even Prohibition curbed the sale of alcohol as the restaurant acted as a speakeasy. Mm -hmm. So attracting all the rebel rousers. But in the same building, the upstairs apartment has served as a smuggler's den, a brothel, a doctor's office, and a boarding house. All things that are haunted. Yes, all things that cause haunted. <laughs> every, thing. All, every one of those things will, will bring about a ghost. Yes. Uh, but the main level has unwaveringly be, been a hotspot for dining and drinking. Now, uh, post-prohibition, the still unnamed pub at this time reopened to the general public, and the bar enjoyed successful business due to its notorious word of mouth reputation as a lawless land where sailors could drink eat gamble and otherwise fraternize freely Um, now sailors journeyed to the infamous bar from across the globe to experience a taste of its revelry Uh, now the bar's uh, devoted fan base dubbed it the green door and uh for its well green door which does remain to its day uh to this very day and the motto of the green door was known from coast to coast Known um, from coast to coast. And it's very, like, tucked in there. Like, if you yeah. walked past it and you didn't know, like, it would look like just any other pub. So the fact that it has such a notorious history is, it says a lot. But uh, it wasn't until the late 1970s that the door finally became the ear in. The current owners cleverly altered the neon um, to the exist- from the existing bar signage to read ear so they just took a couple of the lines out right. to make here, which is cute. Uh, they made this on-the-fly change, one of the few changes made to the New York City landmarks in 1770, to avoid having to wait through the Landmark Commission to approve a formal change of signage. So if you just say it broke, then yeah. they can't say it's anything. It's just the bar sign. Yeah. But just broke a little bit. I think st- still people call it the green door. Yes. I think it's, or it's still known as the green door. They also made this change in homage to the name of their music magazine, Ear, uh, then produced upstairs in the same building. This quirky, defiant touch uh, befits the legacy of the bar as a place for sailors, creatives, and travelers of all planes of morality, mortality, and morality. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But it was once dubbed the defining institution of its neighborhood by Doug Cooper from the New York Times. No bar this idiosyncratic earns that reputation without a few ghost stories. And the ear in doesn't just have a few rumors of sightings, but they have it. Uh, they do have at least one proper ghostly regular. One of the most established regulars known as Mickey the Sailor. Mickey the Sailor. Mickey mm-hmm. the Sailor. Which just recently became copyright uh, free. So uh, 
we were allowed to talk about Mickey. He he, he mm-hmm. was on a steamboat, right? Yes, he was, he was on a, the steamboat. A, a, a steamboat sailor, right? <laughs> with a, a steamboat Mickey. Isn't with that? a stiff scotch. <laughs> or Willie, I guess, was his moniker. Well, time. yeah, that... But that's his. Um, that's <laughs> nom his, de plume. That's not his legal name. Nom, but, nom de mer. <laughs> but he was a regular in his life, having spent the vast majority of his time and money at the bar when he wasn't away at sea. He loved being at the end so much, it's said that he used to sometimes plead with bar staff to keep the place open after they'd shut down shop for the night. There is no clear answer on how Mickey sailed his last mortal voyage. Um, but one leading theory is that Mickey, after a long trip at sea, craved alcohol. And after disembarking his ship, he came straight from the port into the bar in a deranged demeanor, desperate for a drink of hard liquor. He got what he wanted and more uh, and more as he drank and drank and drank until it poisoned him. <laughs> It is believed, per this theory, that the uh, he died on the very place he sat in his bar stool, and that his spirit, undeterred by his cause of death, has been an ongoing patron ever since. The other leading theory on Mickey's death states that Mickey wasn't away at sea, but rather at his home away from home, the Ear Inn, in 1920. Uh, he had a normal night, per his habits of heavy drinking, and then decided to go to his real home. As he drunkenly walked out of the bar, it was cut short because he was struck by a car in the midst of crossing the street and shortly died from his injuries. Given this account, it is possible that my screen will freeze up. (laughs) Oh, did it? Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So given this account, it is possible that his spirit took perpetual refuge in the bar as it was the last safe place his mortal form knew before uh, he, his sudden death. After his death, Mickey loves uh, Mickey's love of the ear and is as strong as ever, albeit even more debauched, as he's been emboldened by crossing over. Now, as a ghost, he's developed a preference for a particular style of supernatural teasing and torment. He doesn't wail and spook bar patrons like the average bar spirit or seek to drive visitors into spirals of shock and fear with grotesque projections. But instead, he prods at waitresses, making them squirm and shriek all the same from his literally cold, presumptuous advances. Boo, Mickey. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Boo. Boo. And so... Uh, Female guests who have stayed upstairs have often encountered Mickey also sneaking into their bed to snuggle up with him. Mickey. I know. Mickey. Honestly, Mickey. Honestly, Mickey. I expect more from a mouse like you. (laughs) (laughs) And so um, basically... Mickey uh, is their main ghost. He uh, loves to pinch cheeks and and you know haunted pubs oftentimes have the 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 lone spirit that sits at the bar. Yes, because uh, uh, even Sixpence Pub here in Savannah, uh, people have said that they've seen a spirit sitting at the bar, like well past closing time, walking you know down Bull Street. You look in and you think you see somebody sitting at the bar. Yeah. So it's it's it, that's a that's a classic pub ghost. Exactly. You, you want uh, a a you know home away from home ghost. You know mm-hmm. this is this is where he felt the most comfortable. This is where he you know identified you know uh, his per, his whole personality was being at the pub. Exactly. And so um, it's just a fun classic ghost story. Yep. And I was it a, is. And it was a nice place to get out of what. So when JT and I went to Hawaii. If you ever have been in a malka shower or what we like to call in the South sprinkling, uh, or if you're in the UK spitting, they call it blessing. Well, it was aggressively blessing this day. And so um, <laughs> we found refuge just like a Mickey. Warmth, all cozy up in the ear in. Yeah, it's really nice. It's very cozy. And um, no, my cheeks did not get pinched by Mickey. Huh? But you never know. Maybe we'll have to go back and stay in the apartment above the, the Yeah, that'd pub. be really cool. Um, we got the information of the, I believe, the general manager oh. of the place. Well, so go. we might go do an investigation one day. You never know. Yeah, but I think that'd be York really dope. insanely haunted. It is. Uh, New York City, if you went borough by borough, you'd find just insane haunting. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I've always wanted to investigate the um, any of the quarantine 
islands mm -hmm. because you have countless unnamed dead um, and continuing on. I mean, even yeah. even during the pandemic, we were burying uh, dead that had no identities. Mm -hmm. The homeless who were getting COVID, things like that were, were I think, Hearts Island. Um, we were still using the mass grave system that we used, you know, for quarantine islands even, you know, just a few years ago. Exactly. So it's fascinating to think that, you know, this amazing metropolis of, you know, so many living people would host as many dead. And it's, I, so what was the statistic, Jay, of how many people die in New York every day? It's oh, like yeah. It was, or it something? was like something like that. Yeah. It was like, it was in the 400s because I Googled it, of course. And not granted, only seven, uh, the statistic is, I think only seven of that number are violent deaths, but that's a lot of people dying every a day. A Seven's a lot. lot. Seven yeah. a day is a lot. <laughs> that is a lot. For, but it's such a big city. You it can't, is a big city. Millions. You, you know. can't expect there not to be so many people dying every mm -hmm. single day. And so when there is death, there are ghosts. So, yep. um, well, the, that, that door, and this is a belief that a lot of people have, is that when, when you pass, in order for the spirit to pass, the, the door opens so that the spirit can go from this plane to the next plane. If you're having that many deaths in a day, that door is open. It's just open. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not opening and closing. <laughs> you just have this constant uh, back and forth of, of spiritual energy, and that is definitely enough to make it a, a haunted, uh, you know, location. Hello. What was that? I don't know. That was really weird. That was. Never heard we that just had a strange weird. sound in the in the studio. It kind of sounded like a door, but where there isn't a door, yeah. <laughs> it like yeah. sounded like a door closing on this wall. <laughs> yes, and it sounded like, "Yep, you're correct." Closing the door. Yeah, like a <laughs> like. <laughs> um, but yes, jingles, jingles. What a good guy. <laughs> But if uh, I know we actually have quite a few listeners that live in New York City. Um, so if you live in New York, write us in a ghost mail about yeah. your yeah. paranormal Tell us experiences. All kinds of ghost stories. I've, I've heard wonderful ghost stories, <laughs> wonderful ghost stories, uh, terrifying ghost stories on subways. Mm -hmm. I've heard Ooh. ghost stories, you know, uh, just in the dead of night walking around the streets. Um, I'm sure Times Square draws quite a few spirits oh, with all yeah. that electricity yeah. and all of that life. Every theater is going to be haunted. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So let us know your New York ghost story if you live there or if you used to live there or if you've been there and had a ghost encounter uh, or if you didn't send us in a ghost story. We love reading our ghost mail. But uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this and you enjoyed seeing the photos of us going around New York and seeing all these creepy and haunted and tragic places. Um, Turn but, every trip into a haunted trip. <laughs> I mean, we do that in general. We do that. That's true. That's yeah. fair. That's well, fair. Well, because what I think some people forget is that. We started this podcast because it's our interest. Because yeah, yeah. We, we, so, it's how we talk anyway. Exactly. So if you're gonna be there, you might as well see the creepy. I'll things. probably be going to Alcatraz. Ooh. Oh, really? No. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I'll do it. Uh, do a to San little. Francisco, uh, uh, in March. And okay. I'll probably you take go a in there. Yeah, bring the pocket Ooh, three yeah. and yeah. shoot a little bit of it. Yeah, that'd be really Absolutely. dope. That would be super cool. That would be cool. Um, but yes, thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode. We hope you enjoyed. Uh, if you have a ghost story you would like to send to us, you can send it to ghostmail at hauntedcitypodcast.com. Also, um, I'm sure if you are a part of the Facebook fan page, um, it's been time of the year where we have Connect Savannah voting. Uh, nominations just ended today. Okay. Um, so the top 10 of each category is going to be posted Fingers crossed. I know a lot of you have been nominating us. So I'm hoping that we should be nominated for lots when of do these. We, when do we learn when the nominations happen again? Uh, it should be in the next couple in the days. Next week, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Next week. And cool, 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 cool. so uh, keep up to date with that. Uh, Shout out to uh, Ashley yeah, and Don. Yeah, Para Junkie President Ashley and Don. They've, uh, they've really gone they've super gone hard. They've gone super hard. <laughs> Um, and so keep abreast with them because they will let you know, of course, when um, voting will begin. Uh, it's a really big deal here in Savannah to win these awards. So uh, also vote for Chris's sister as best all around Savannian. Or, mm -hmm. um, She's a pretty mm -hmm. fantastic Savannian. Yes. And so uh, Ashley and Don have been posting the categories that we will be more than likely, uh, hopefully, nominated for. Uh, so thank you guys again. Mm -hmm. uh, and with that... Stay spooky, y'all. <laughs>